Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, we just have five more minutes to big start for the webinar. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, today, we have with us um, Svetlana from Disney and Kiki from Disney. Uh, Svetlana is going to be the major speaker uh, and the presenter for this evening. Uh, she is a developer advocate from Zedrin. Uh, in other five minutes, we will be starting. Uh, Anna, if you have anything to tell me, you can, start, uh, you can share your screen uh, right now and wait until seven and we can get started. Would that be okay? Uh, Swatlana, I think we can start now. Amazing, thank you. Uh, can you share your screen, please? I've shared it. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, Vellana, we can see your screen. Um, okay, yeah. awesome. Yes. Um, it is seven and uh, we will be starting the webinar very soon. Uh, a quick round of introduction. Uh, so um, I am Ramya. I am supporting uh, all of you through the entire campaign. Uh, you must have received a good amount of emails from my end in case you have any queries or if you need any support, Please please reach out to me. Uh, we also have today uh, Svetlana, the president, and also Pratik, who is supporting this campaign. Uh, Svetlana is uh, the developer advocate from JetBrain. Uh, I will probably uh, hand over to, to her, and uh, nevertheless, we can start the webinar. Over to you, Svetlana. Thank you so much. Thank you. So please confirm that uh, everything is uh, well. Uh, I think that uh, then we can start and I will talk today about uh, the Kotlin programming language. As I understand, most of our participants haven't tried it and now are interested in why they might be interested in Kotlin. And I will try to uh, give answers to these questions. So let's start. In short, Kotlin is a general purpose language that you can use to solve any of the tasks. It uh, combines both object-oriented programming style and functional programming style in one language. So you can use uh, both styles for different purposes and easily mix them. Also, it is a statically typed language in comparison to Python and some others. And uh, that means that uh, we have really good ID support and uh, other benefits. It's open source. It's mostly developed by JetBrains with the help of the community. And if you want, you also can contribute to some of the parts. So it's all free. You can uh, find the source code and um, investigate it. Kotlin is a concise, safe language. It is so called modern language and it is very similar to other modern languages available nowadays. One of its important characteristics is its goal of interoperability. So we not only want to have to use Kotlin from scratch to have Kotlin uh, to use it independently on other languages. But what we want is to be able to mix it with other available languages. And uh, first, of course, comes Java. And uh, I will highlight some of uh, the features that uh, help us to gain, to reach this interoperability. But this is uh, important characteristics also for other languages. So we want you to be able to use Kotlin together with other, other languages. JetBrains is a tooling company. It is creator of many different IDEs for different languages. And that's why you can expect really good tooling for Kotlin. And that is the case. You use IntelliJ IDEA, or Android Studio, mostly with Kotlin, and you'll see that you have great tooling support for Kotlin there. Kotlin is not a research project. It is not something from academia for academic purposes. It is based on many existing languages, and it tries to use whatever works well there and uh, to omit 
or change or modify whatever doesn't work there, doesn't work well. And also, the one of the core principle is we want to strive pragmatism. We want Kotlin tries to be pragmatic. So every solution, every design decision is made keeping this pragmatism in mind, how people will use it in real life and uh, in real projects. So it's not something to, to research, to see whether some functionality will work or not. We, we, de we do it with experimental features, but a little bit. Mainly, it is something to be used in real life and real industry. A bit of history. We started the project now is almost 10 years ago, and uh, it took long six years to reach the first version. A lot of things were tried in real life and lots of things were changed. And the solution was uh, good enough, was so good that it interested lots of people. And uh, one of the most um, uh, use case one of the areas where developers find it really useful was mobile development for android and uh, that's why it was made by google official on android in 2017 it wa wasn't a decision from the top on the contrary it was um, based on the feedback of real developers so many people went uh, tried kotlin they liked it and they kind of asked Google for their official approval. So for many companies, it is important that uh, language should be officially approved. And that's why they shared the, this desire to have it uh, officially. So um, they did it. It was really great. And um, now uh, current stable version is uh, Kotlin 1.3 released two years ago, but uh, now we're very close to the next version, uh, Kotlin 1.4. It was released this year. We have uh, many users and uh, the, our user gr base is growing, is constantly growing. Uh, these numbers uh, count uh, people who edited Kotlin code at least once. So if we are talking about uh, people who regularly use Kotlin, it will be fewer people, but still the numbers are impressive and uh, the Kotlin uh, community is growing. And we hope that you will be a part of this community. Kotlin can be used for different target platforms. So at first, and the first platform was Kotlin JVM. In, you can use Kotlin instead of Java, but it's not only this. We also have Kotlin uh, JavaScript and uh, Kotlin for native. So you can compile Kotlin for native binaries and use it, for instance, for iOS development. Uh, a little more on that later. The main platform, uh, the main stable platform is Kotlin JVM, and uh, the majority of people who try Kotlin they mean uh, Kotlin for JVM. However, these uh, web stories and uh, native stories are also in active development. And uh, uh, we hope to see much more people use Kotlin for this target. So there are already are, but not, um, but much uh, fewer than for JVM, for the main platform. When we are talking about JVM, it's two stories server side and Android. Some of you might think that Kotlin is just a language for Android, for mobile development there. It's not the case. Kotlin can be used for server side and a big percentage of our users are for, uh, on Kotlin JVM are from server side. So it's not that, uh, so most are on Android, but not total majority, there's quite a lot of, uh, the, of people that are using it for server side in different companies all over the world. So it's one of the things to, uh, to consider and uh, it turns out to be very useful there. And uh, another kind of new story, something that is uh, so far hasn't released in a stable version, but it is our future. It is what we want from Kotlin. Uh, in the future, so you can try it even now. 
However, for now, uh, it's uh, not yet in a so-called stable state, but uh, it is under active development. And this thing is multi-platform projects and being able to use Kotlin for the whole stack. When you use, when you have two different apps, Android and iOS, and you can write, uh, you, you can write them in Kotlin, and also you can share some parts between Android in, and iOS written in Kotlin. But also your server can be written in Kotlin JVM, and you can use Kotlin JavaScript to you can use Kotlin and compile it to JavaScript to to use uh, to write code for web, to write code that runs in your browser, and uh, this illustrates this Kotlin full stack story and uh, shows that Kotlin can be used in many different areas for different purposes. And one of the goal is to be able to reuse parts of your application for different platforms or between an Android or OS or between server and web. And that is the thing now. That is what we have under active development, and you can try it even now. In this talk, I won't go deep into a setup, how to set up all these things, how to um, how to write, uh, how to share the code in Android OS. I will uh, talk about specific language features that, in my opinion, make Kotlin so interesting and uh, so important uh, that uh, explain why it got uh, so popular uh, but i will in the end of the talk i will give you the links where you find uh, you can find more information about also about multi-platform uh, development that i've just mentioned so let's start and uh, the first uh, feature that i want to uh, highlight is nullability. Okay, I will probably uh, need... Uh, do, do we have any questions right now? I think that I'm not sure I'll, I'll, I can see the chat. Uh, none at the moment, Mr. Flana. Okay, so great. I think I will continue, but uh, please, if you have any questions, just uh, write them in the chat and we'll, I will answer them either during the talk or at the end of, pre at the, end of the presentation. So I think that now uh, we got introduction. Yes? Yeah, so there are some questions in the question box, um, I think, of if you want me to read. Um, does interoperable mean Kotlin can be converted to any can, object? Can, uh, can you, sorry, can you, can, uh, can you, uh, Prati, can you just uh, share the questions to my, uh, to me? Uh, yeah. And I will yeah. answer. Okay, I will, I will, I will do that. Maybe just carry on, and I will. Uh, yes, uh, I will. Yes, so, so, uh, sorry, uh, I will continue with my presentation, and yes. afterwards I will answer all the questions. So thank you. So yeah, just participants, please ask your questions in the, um, in the chat, and I will answer. So, so now I will cover the language features, and uh, uh, answer directly if there are questions around these features, and afterwards at the end I will answer all the rest questions, all the remaining one. So nullability. What is the problem? And it is like something that is shared by so many different languages. And so it even has this special name, billion dollar mistake. Uh, this name was, uh, in, um, was uh, suggested by Sir Tony Har, who invented uh, the null reference in the first place, like a couple of decades ago. What is the problem? You often see this uh, mess error message. A problem occurred, serial log for more details, and error log just says us that mm, there is no point of exception. And it is common not only for code, like it, it is present in Java, and Kotlin tries to fix this Java problem, but it also can be a case for other languages. And modern languages, including Kotlin, all try to fix this problem and the shared solution so again it's not that something that only Kotlin does this idea to fix this uh, null pointer exception problem is shared between 
all the modern languages. So, so they all try to do something about it. And the modern approach is to make this null pointer exception a compile time error rather than a runtime error. So what is there again? Imagine your, uh, your string variable stores null reference, and then you try to dereference this string, and the compiler allows you to do that, but then you have this exception at runtime, and that's what we try to avoid, because you never know what caused this null pointer exception in the first place. It's hard to understand it, to investigate it, and it's much easier to just use it, to just prevent it when you write the code. So what Kotlin does here? Kotlin makes a distinction between non-nullable types and nullable types. You can store and um, only not nullable reference in a not nullable type. So you can't assign null to this string variable. But you can do it for nullable types. So this works. You can store null or a string in a string of in a variable of nullable type. Then you can easily dereference the first variable that works, no questions. However, if you try to reference the second variable, no, it doesn't work. The compiler says, do something. It's not a legal aggression. It's illegal. This might look like a simple idea, and you may wonder, yeah, that's a logical thing to do. But it wasn't done before, so like it's still a feature that is not present in Java, and it might be really hard to add it to Java now. So there are some solutions with annotations, but still it's not a built-in language feature. How would you deal with nullable types in Kotlin? Whenever you have a, a variable of a nullable type, the Kotlin compiler forces you to check it explicitly to avoid exceptions. So you have to think what, what, what would you do in case of null reference. You can do it directly. However, there are shorter, better ways. And even in, uh, IDE suggests you to use one of these ways. In this case, it suggests to replace this if expression with a safe access expression. And now this code looks like this. You just use question mark, dot, and that means do it, do this operation, only if the reference is not null. You can also return a result here. In this case, we assign re the result of a check into nullable variable, and uh, this is the same as using question mark dot operation. So it is called safe access operator, and uh, it is also not a Kotlin invention. First, it was uh, present in Groovy, and it turned out that uh, these kind of operations worked really well there. So people were happy, the developers were happy to use these operations. They helped them to have concise, clear code. And Kotlin just uses the same, the same way, the same operations. Here we see that the result is nullable type. So whenever we return null, that means that the result is nullable. If we have a default value, we can, and we want to assign this result to regular variable, not nullable variable, we can provide these default values by using so-called Elvis operator. So it's also possible to, to just say, okay, use this value if this expression is null, or just do this, handling uh, error handling procedure if the result was null. Kotlin compiler, Kotlin language gives a lots of lots of way how to do this. Also, Kotlin compiler is quite smart and uh, if you see that uh, the uh, that uh, the uh, the variable uh, th th that you check the, whether the variable is not null and then you say, for instance, fail or throw exception, then Kotlin compiler allows you to, to interpret, to use this variable afterwards as it was not null. 
And if you want, you can also make null pointer exception explicit by using these two exclamation marks, and that will throw null pointer exception is if this variable is null. So you can write the code like this. And um, I yeah, often uh, emphasize here that when you when I when you learn how null pointer how nullable types work in Kotlin. And then you also learn how they work in Swift, because Swift, as a modern language, have very similar approach to nullable types, and they have very similar syntax, and the, and many operations are kind of the same. And for this, uh, making null pointer exception explicit, they use one exclamation mark, and Kotlin uses two. It kind of tries to say try to avoid this operation, try to avoid these two exclamation marks syntax in order to keep your code clean and, uh, uh, and simple. So yeah, we have this in the language, but also we recommend uh, to, uh, to check always explicitly, to always see what, what is uh, going on. Under the hood, these nullable types are implemented as annotations and uh, not extra wrappers. That means there is no performance overhead when you use nullable types. So you use these nullable types for free. At runtime, nullable and not nullable objects will be stored similarly. There will be no extra wrappers. And that is very different from another solution that you might often find in different languages that solves the same problem. This solution is called optional. And the idea is that when you store, want to store a value that might be absent, instead of using null reference, you use an extra class optional. And uh, this class tells you whether there is a value or there is no value. And uh, this solves the same problem, basically the same problem that many languages have of this null pointer exception. And Kotlin solution in comparison to these optional types might be often better because it brings no performance overhead, because we do not have to create all these extra wrappers to, st to store reference. And that is a big advantage. Now I'm going to the next uh, feature. And uh, if you have any questions about nullable types, I will just briefly check. I think that I uh, don't see it right that now. Out there. Yeah, there yeah, I just. Questions? Yes, I see the questions. Thank you. I'm just ah, there is uh, what happened. Um, I, I, so so right now I want to only question to answer only questions about nullable types, and all the rest will be answered at the end of my talk. What happens if an empty list uh, for uh, right for slings? So uh, in my case here, there was uh, some questions about uh, empty list. Uh, in my case, in my scenario here, S variable has the type string. Uh, and uh, if you store a list inside this uh, variable uh, and uh, try to, to access uh, the lens, it will... Uh, so when we're talking about list, uh, the, um, if uh, we define a variable of the type nullable list, then... Uh, it, it works uh, just uh, the same. If it uh, stores uh, actual list, then you can assign this size and it returns the value. If the variable is null, then you return null, null as a result. So I'm not, uh, okay, at least I've tried to answer this question that looks like something connected with nullability. If you have more, uh, questions and not truly really satisfied with the answer, just uh, write them. I will see them later. And now I will go on to my next feature, extension functions, and uh, cover uh, this uh, functionality and highlight 
why I think it is very important a future and uh, um, which benefits it brings us uh, for um, interoperability and other things. <clears throat> so at first, uh, the functionality. In Java, you can you know, define classes and uh, members in, uh, and functions as members inside these classes, but you can't define function somewhere, just uh, separate two classes. In Kotlin, you can do so, you can just define functions, but also, interesting thing, you can define so-called extension functions. And uh, that means you can define uh, you can mm, take existing class, whether it was defined in Java or in Kotlin, it doesn't matter. It might be a class from a separate library that you just use. And you can write your own extensions to this function, to this class. And uh, my example with string is very typical for Java, because in Java, I think like almost every project either has its own string utils class or uses a library that provides string util class. Because string in Java lacks many useful methods and you would often need these methods like last character in this string. And it is typical pattern to define this method somewhere and use it. In Kotlin, you can do very similar thing. When you have a class with a fixed API that you can't change because someone else owns this class, you still can extend it by defining an extension function. How do you do it? You define a function and then this function is visible in uh, the completion list. So it is easily discoverable. You, for instance, want to see what functions are available in string and uh, in completion, you see not only members of this class, but also your own extensions, but also some functionality that you want to add to this class. So that uh, it is very small feature to some extent, but it brings lots of value. How you define extension function? You, you as you can see, you simply define, you, you simply write down the class that you want to extend, put dot and then define a function and afterwards you can use you can refer to uh to the class to the receiver using this reference that's it nothing complicated you can just define this function somewhere and and uh, use uh um, and afterwards you can use it uh as it was a member as usual for this, you can emit it and your function just looks uh, like very simple uh, thing. You can, uh, it looks like this uh, extension function was a member, but uh, it is, it is uh, not. In Kotlin, when you use an extension function, you need to explicitly import it. So it's not that, uh, all the extension functions are available. You specifically list uh, which extension functions you want to use, and uh, you import them. And afterwards, you can you can use it as a member function. And if you want, you can import import all the uh, functions defined in a specific package, for instance. Interesting question: How would you call extension functions from Java, and is it possible and uh, the answer is yes it's possible i've already told you that uh, kotlin that it is very easy to mix kotlin and java code in one project it's not a problem and um, these extension functions under the hood are implemented as regular java static functions so under the hood, they are very similar to the pattern that you would use if you define such function in Java. In Java, if you need string uh, extensions, some kind of string utils, you would define all these functions as static functions. And in Kotlin, under the hood, 
it is the same. So extensions are just syntactic functionality over static functions with uh, that add receiver, but they are very, uh, very useful. So Kotlin standard library, when we are talking specifically about Kotlin JVM, is to a great extent just combination of Java standard library and a bunch of extensions. So we don't want to reinvent Java standard library. We don't want to reinvent all these code bases that or all these libraries and frameworks that already work well, very well for Java. We just provide a way to extend them to make them more Kotlin, Kotlin-ish, to improve them. But you can use whatever is present in Java and in other languages. So extensions are very powerful. They allow us to have very smooth interoperability with existing languages like Java, and they allow us to use all uh, the functionality that is already written in Java, that is already present in Java. To illustrate, if you define, you can use the same standard collections in Kotlin, and whenever you create a collection, if you check what what um, what is under the hood, which classes are created, you'll find out that Java standards classes are created under the hood. So that means indeed that Kotlin just adds all these useful extensions, but uses the standard Java collections. And you can see lots of lots of you can find lots of useful extensions uh, on Java that uh, simplify uh, usage uh, of the collection. So again, to repeat, uh, there is no such thing as Kotlin SDK at least so far. It's uh, when we're talking about Kotlin JVM and classical Kotlin usage. So Kotlin SDK is just Java SDK and a bunch of extensions. That's it. So it is very easy. And it gives us a couple of benefits, small runtime jar and very easy Java interoperability. Um, so I will uh, check uh, the questions now. Uh, can we extend uh, private functions of class? No, we, ca uh, we cannot even access private class, uh, private functions in a class. We only uh, can access public functions in the class. And um, in this sense, extension functions is just the same as defining a static function in Java in terms of accessibility is is very very similar <clears throat> and uh, if you want to make this extension function private itself for instance in a file that's possible so you can define a private extension function that will be available only inside this file or you can define an extension function that only will be available inside a specific module that is possible. Uh, how much overhead does it have using extensions, uh, which are Java classes uh, under the hood? No overhead because under the hood it is compiled to just to, to extension function under the hood is very similar to static function from Java and it is under the hood their static function in the bytecode. From when you use it in Kotlin, you only think in terms of extensions, but at the bytecode is an old static function, and static functions are quite cheap. They don't have any overhead or virtual inheritance and uh, understanding which function will be called, so they are the cheapest. In this case, extensions are also cheap. <clears throat> Uh, if a class is final in Java, is it possible to define extension functions for final class in Java? Yes, there is it's, uh, no difference, and that is indeed important. So whenever you have a final... So extensions is not the same as inheritance. 
you're doing very different thing. You kind of define static functions, but that can be syntactically, only syntactically used from Kotlin and only from Kotlin as members. But in fact, it they they are really like static functions under the hood. So this simple kind of trick that instead of um, inheriting from the class, you can provide extensions, turns out to be pragmatic. So it's something not written in the book of object-oriented programming, probably when you, uh, I don't know, when you, uh, which often imply that you are the only author of all the code base and you can think about it and uh, imagine the best uh, inheritance hierarchy that you can only invent and uh, then you support it. No, in, in real life you have like just so many libraries that someone else have written for you and many of the classes in these libraries will be final and uh, Kotlin just provides you the way to improve how you work with these classes. And this turns out to be really, really useful. Uh, do functions defined as final behaves the same as in Java in terms of members? Yes, you can define. Uh, actually, in uh, uh, in Kotlin, is vice versa. In Java, you need to find to to add the modifier final to make it final, either class or function. In Kotlin, all all functions and classes are final by default, and only when you want to make it non-final, you provide explicit open modifier. And that's also connected with um, kind of a, a characteristic in Java that uh, some design decisions were made, but then <clears throat> some best practices appeared and uh, such <clears throat> best practices told us that tried to, uh, uh, to uh, make uh, all the inheritance explicit, inheritance choices uh, explicit and um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> in this case Kotlin uh, uses this design principle and uh, provides you uh, another default. So this default was not just the idea oh, let's do this but just it was based on experience on, on exper on many years of experience with Java. <clears throat> Uh, uh, there is a question whether Kotlin gets converted to bytecode at the end of the day. Sure, yes. Uh, the Kotlin, if you if we talk about Kotlin Java, then the Kotlin code is compiled to Java bytecode, and that is how you use it on uh, uh, on Kotlin Java on your virtual machine. If we're talking about Kotlin JavaScript and Kotlin native, then Kotlin can be compiled to JavaScript code or it can be compiled to native binaries. So we have these three options, but uh, during my future coverage and because JVM is uh, the major use case, main use case, I always refer to Java bytecode. Yeah, but um, in theory, you uh, there are many options. Uh, okay, so I think uh, that now I can I uh, still have some time, so I, I will move to Coroutine's topic, and after that I will try to answer uh, all the remaining questions. So um, let's start with Coroutine's. And um, calling Coroutine's is something, it, so it wasn't uh, presented in the very first version of Kotlin, it appeared later. And if now someone asks me something like, okay, so why Kotlin and not Java 20? I don't know, 15. Okay, probably by 20 they will add them, but why not Java? Why not the latest Java, the latest version of, of Java? And I would really probably reply coroutines. So this is something used. This is a feature that try to change lots of things. Most of the other features, they are kind of based on best practices in other languages, 
they were already present in one way or another. They were already battle tested. But Curtis was this uh, first hand experience, was something new that Kotlin brings to the table. And if we try to dig deeper and uh, see what was before, we'll find out that it's not, uh, it's kind of old but forgotten way to do asynchronous programming, um, but now it is considered as new way to do asynchronous programming. So the terms of coroutines were used if you were, uh, if you could be a student like 60 years ago and learned uh, software engineering and uh, computer science, they used, they manipulated this term of coroutines. If you dig deeper and try to find the literature from that time, you'll find this term. But now Kotlin brings it to life again to see what, uh, how it can help to modern life programming. So, coroutines have something to do with asynchronous programming. Good to know. Let's um, continue. They are, I, I say that, okay, it's something new, but it was greatly inspired by many features from other languages. First, a single weight in C sharp and uh, go routines and channels in Go. I think it's type, it should be go routine and many more. So there are some similarities, but uh, uh, lots of things, some of things were really new. And uh, I will just give you a brief introduction to, the core, to this topic. We'll try to highlight the main benefits, but um, I will, afterwards, I will recommend to, to read more and to dig deeper uh, on this topic. So what uh, is our example? Imagine we have a simple consecutive logic, something like you need to call login function that logs your user into a system and um, it returns your user ID. Then you need to load more data. After you get the ID, you need to load more data about the user. And finally, you can show the resulting user, the resulting in for to someone who asks for it. And uh, if we write this code in this way, it has two problems. Each of these separation, login and load, is probably a network connection or connection to a remote database, and it can be slow. So whenever we uh, ask for login, we send this network request, and then we have to wait until we get the response, and this waiting time just consumes our resources. And if you write your code for Android or for mobile, for mobile or for desktop where you have UI, user interface, then it is a best practice. It is recommended not to push this code on the main thread. And uh, uh, in this case, you try to work around it somehow with different libraries, with different approaches, but you still uh, don't write this code. And if we're talking about server side, such code, you can write such code, but then it will be not effective usage of resources. So whenever you are waiting for network response, your thread will be blocked and um, it will be hard to see, uh, to, to fix it and um, to find, find the solution to it. One of the solutions to this problem, one of the ways to rewrite this code in order to improve it, in order to fix this waiting problem or ineffective resources problem, is to rewrite it with callbacks. Here I used example from Java 8, completable future, but you can write the similar code with Rx Java or with other libraries. And uh, the idea will be a very similar, just you just use, uh, you just extract uh, the remaining code inside a lambda and you kind of manipulate with these lambdas in order to avoid blocking the thread, but you have to do some special about, something special about it. And you need to learn how, uh, all this API, how to work with this, um, 
with a completable future or um, Rx streams and so on. With Kotlin, the solution is much simpler. So in order to avoid blocking thread or blocking the user, if we're talking about main thread in your apps, you just define and implement all these functions as suspend functions. That's it. So the only thing that changes is we add suspend modifiers to all the first functions. And that's the only thing that we change. And now we no longer have the same problem as before. We somehow fixed everything and I will uh, right now try to illustrate how exactly we have fixed this. But first, suspend functions. What is a suspend function? It is a function that can be suspended. That's it. Very easy. You can ask, where can you call a suspend function? And uh, if you try to call a suspend function from a regular function, then you'll find an error. And the Kotlin compiler telling you that no such function should be only called from a coroutine or another suspend function. And now we have this question, okay, what is a coroutine? Coroutine is a computation that can be suspended. It might be called a lightweight thread, but um, it's um, so it's something much more lightweight than thread. It's very small computation. However, such computation runs on a thread. And uh, imagine we have some small computation, for instance, network request, and we start it on a thread. And then at some point when this computation waits for something, for the result from network or for something else, it can be suspended and in the meantime thread is free to do other tasks. So now when the computation is suspended because it waits for something, our thread can continue to uh, to respond to user requests or continue to do some other activities and it is not blocked. So when the result, uh, when we get the, get the result, we can continue this computation on the same thread. There are some ways, uh, some specific way to create a coroutine. You can invoke one of so-called coroutine builders so you can uh, call async to start a new computation asynchronously on a different thread or as a starting point you can start a new computation in a blocking way by using calling run blocking and it is often an entry point to our to uh, to the code that manipulates coroutines i will show you this simple load image example. Here we only want to asynchronously load image, let uh, the main thread be free while we're doing this, wait for this result somehow, and uh, after the image is loaded we'll show it to the user. And I will uh, demonstrate how we use all these uh, coroutine functions. So first, async. Async starts a new computation, starts a new asynchronous computation on a thread. So here we just say, okay, start this loading process on a thread. On a, usually, usually it's a different thread from a thread pool. So async starts this new computation. And after we started this computation on a different thread, we can call await and await is defined as a suspend function so if you go to the declaration of await you will see it is marked as suspend and that means await is the point that can make your computation suspended so let's see step by step 
first we load image we call load image async that starts new asynchronous computation on a second thread here we started uh, on a, this green rectangle is our asynchronous computation then uh, in the meantime so it's asynchronous computation so it starts on a different thread at the same time so they run asynchronously and then process image continues to run and reaches a weight so in the meantime we could do some other stuff here in the process image we could load more images or do other stuff whenever we call a weight that means that we can do nothing useful and we just need the result of e loaded image and that is the point the time that instructs the compiler to suspend this process image computation so now after we call await we have the following situation we have computation run or loading image computation run on a second thread and the first thread is free to do something else because the main computation is suspended and when the result is ready when the image is loaded we can restore the computation of the first thread and continue the execution and show finally the result to the user but you see that we do this uh, loading asynchronously and uh, we can show the result from the main ui thread to the user and routines allow us easily do that going back to our first example show user coroutine can have many suspension points and in our case here we have two network requests the first one that goes to uh, that gets login that gets the first id data then the second network request that loads some information from the network and they both are suspension points and our main computation can be suspended while waiting for this uh, result from network while waiting for uh, for the result of our requests request so here you see that the main thread is free but we suspend our computation twice or even more depending on how the login and load functions are implemented and uh, one uh, last thing I want to highlight in regard to coroutines is the thing that is new to uh, to, uh, to, to even to the coroutines and um, uh, this is something also very powerful it is called a structural concurrency and um, that uh, also changes uh, the way how uh, do, how do, how people write how people implement these asynchronous computations and uh, i will uh, show you uh, the example now instead of loading one image we want to load two images in parallel in my case it will be a like, green and red image so we start uh, loading these two uh, images asynchronously in two different threads for instance and then we wait for the result and show the result when the when it's ready but the question here is what happens if an exception is thrown while loading the first image and the answer is the answer that at first was true for coroutines so in the first release of coroutines there was no structural concurrency and it works this way uh, the second coroutine was leaking and uh, it is uh, it also something that happens for uh, in other similar system might be so uh, this uh, the structural concurrency is a very new important idea that uh, brings changes uh, to how they're implemented uh, so again what is our problem we have uh, the first loading uh, failed 
So there was some network problem, something uh, went wrong. And then the main coroutine fails and, um, and returns with exception. However, this second uh, image continues to load, to, to load. We haven't stopped it. And the first solution uh, that you had to use in coroutines was to, um, to count explicitly all the references to subcoroutines and to, to, to cancel explicitly whenever something happens. And that is something that might be done by the library. So you don't have to write all this code that prevents the second coroutine from leaking. It can be done automatically for you. And that is exactly what structured concurrency does. So it says, okay, use a special way to define, to start these new coroutines, start them in a scope. And now, uh, in fact, you, you can't uh, start uh, a new coroutine without a scope. You always have to provide the scope that, um, that has, that owns the coroutine. So when you use the scope, then if the first coroutine fails, the main coroutine, the main scope catches exception and cancels the second coroutine. And that is important. So it's, it's not that important how exactly you achieve that, which, which uh, syntax you use, you can later find it out in documentation. Important thing is that it is different. So uh, this, uh, this fact uh, that we should um, process uh, exception, that we should uh, catch them and cancel whatever is going on automatically, is this new thing that Kotlin brings to the table, that Kotlin coroutines change in the way how many people write code. So that is one of the important things. So coroutines, uh, like easy way to do asynchronous programming, suspension points, but also structured concurrency. Um, so yeah, it is uh, structured concurrency is implemented with coroutine scope. It waits for the completion of all the child coroutines and cancels all the child coroutines if it itself get cancelled either by uh, catching exception or someone else, some, somehow else. Uh, so uh, this uh, was what I wanted to show you, kind of try to motivate you to look deeper into coroutines because coroutines is a complicated concept. I try to highlight the mm, some benefits but if you haven't um, got got it. That's like it's it, it's something difficult. It's something new to many people. So it's uh, uh, just fine. I just hoped I showed I, I motivated you enough to, um, to to want to learn more about it. And there are really more about it. So uh, there is this coroutine support in a language and library has lots of uh, like and m many other things are implemented in the Kotlin X Coroutines library which are single weight channels like in Go, flows, analogous to active streams and also even yield construct which has nothing to do with asynchronous programming but it also uses the mechanism of coroutines. So there is a lot more to, to learn and to investigate here. Uh, so now uh, it's time to give you some links and to answer the questions. I think at first I will finish my presentation with the slides to give you some uh, further links. And afterwards I will start reading the questions and answering them. So in case you're not interested, you feel free to, to leave and to do some other stuff. But first I will give you the links where you can learn more about Kotlin. So this is the book about Kotlin, Kotlin Action. We've written it now many years ago, I think um, four probably. And um, uh, we haven't yet updated it. It uh, uh, writes about Kotlin, the first version of Kotlin and it uh, says uh, sometime or oh, in the future version it will be this or that. So it should be updated, but it's still, pra uh, it's still a practical way to use Kotlin. Uh, Nothing that much changed from the first release. Um, we, th this book doesn't cover coroutines, 
So coroutines is a huge new topic that should be learned somewhere else. I will give resources, but uh, the most of the features that were already there, mm, the, they are present on this book and it describes them uh, it describes well the motivation of why we did this or that in comparison to java note that uh, it targeted uh, it is targeted at java developers so it makes sense to read it if you already know java and uh, and have some experience in it because it often uh, digs deeper, sees what's going on under the hood in the byte code, in the byte code compares with Java, and it also doesn't cover uh, the basics. Like it doesn't explain you what a class is, what is inheritance. It assumes that you already know all of that because you're a Java developer. Uh, the similar um, material uh, is this Kotlin uh, course at Coursera. It is even called Kotlin for Java developers. So it is similar to the book in a sense that it covers Kotlin on top of Java and makes comparison with Java and explains what is different, what is um, uh, what was the reasons to do, uh, what were the reasons uh, for some design decisions and so on. Uh, so uh, yeah, it is just uh, another format. It is video format. Note that you can. Um, like the content is free, is available for free. Coursera unfortunately uh, makes it uh, quite hard to find this option, but you can find the audit option and then you can uh, access, have access to all the course content for free. Uh, but um, at first, Coursera will ask you to pay, but you only pay if you want certificate and uh, uh, be able to or to do assignments. But I'm must uh, admit that actually I made the assignments a bit too complicated, probably, and uh, not many people uh, do them um, because they require a lot of time and attention. And uh, if you just want to to learn Kotlin fast based on your Java knowledge, uh, you you might just watch the videos and do small tasks without doing the assignments. So it's also a good option. Uh, we have uh, now, uh, we are working on another book together with Bersaikel. Uh, this book suits for newbies. So in this book, Atomic Kotlin, we cover Kotlin from scratch. We explain all the concepts from the beginning, what is a class, even what is a variable, and what is a loop. And uh, it also gives some shortcuts. If you already know some stuff, you can uh, jump uh, through the content and read only some summary. Uh, so this is this uh, full textbook because it's this full textbook uh, we haven't uh, completed it yet. It's um, uh, another long-term uh, project, but it's uh, uh, it's almost completed. Uh, you can find uh, this um, uh, the content uh, already. Most of the content already on available online. You can also find a free sample uh, for preview uh, to see whether there's something you want. Uh, the book um, is, uh, to, uh, is for sale, so uh, the whole resource is not free, but you can first check whether it looks like something you would like to do. And uh, uh, this book uh, is accompanied by the course, the educational course in IDE. And um, if uh, there are some, not only students, but uh, some professors or some teaching assistant who, who listen to us, uh, that might be interesting uh, for those who might decide to do their own Kotlin courses at universities. You can check this content and um, you can build something similar or use parts of it because I think it's, it's great for education. And uh, it uh, covers Kotlin step by step, and it doesn't imply your understanding on how it already works. It uh, also it is also a guide that step by step uh, shows you how to uh, how to do do it. And uh, we have there the hands-on lab intro to coroutines and channels that you can browse and do if you want to learn more about coroutines and get some practice. And afterwards, you can read our documentation about coroutines. And also, I can highly recommend uh, the talks by Roman Ilizarov from Kotlin Conf conferences. At each conference, uh, he, 
usually has a talk about coroutines and you can even see how it was uh, from historical perspective so for instance last uh, in 2018 he introduces structural concurrency and you see how uh, he motivates it uh, and so on so it might be interesting another uh, thing that uh, might interest you is uh, a material here that uh, uh, explains how to build Kotlin app that targets both iOS and Android so this is this new story of Kotlin multi-platform this is the story when Kotlin, when you use Kotlin not only for JVM but also for native. And in this case, you target iOS development. So in this hands-on, uh, you can uh, follow uh, this step-by-step -step guide how to set up this project uh, so that you could play with it or investigate it further. So I'm done with my slides. Uh, I will now read through the question but uh, if you decide not to uh, to listen to, uh, to to wait for all the questions then have a nice question and um, uh, now i will uh, just uh, look through the questions that uh, you asked uh, during the webinar uh, so i think i can start from scratch mm, Kotlin can be used uh, service side alongside Java and also the client side uh, with JavaScript is the try. Yes, so you can, um, uh, you, when you're talking about uh, JavaScript, you might be interested uh, to use it both alongside Java, or JavaScript or just try the full uh, uh, web part entirely in Kotlin and just compile it to JavaScript. So when you use Kotlin and compile it to JavaScript, you can benefit from the whole JavaScript ecosystem. So you can use all the JavaScript libraries and uh, some JavaScript frameworks like React. There, is also, there are also materials on our hands-on labs how to set up, how to create such full stack app uh, using uh, React, Kotlin React. And uh, there are uh, materials about it um, yes, and also you can share the code, share some code between server and client. It uh, might uh, be useful, for instance, if you want to, sh uh, to uh, if your server and client um, sh uh, change messages and you want these messages to be typed, to be classes, and in this case, you can share the model. So, for instance, you create these different types of messages and uh, you use uh, similar declarations, actually the same declarations for server side uh, and for uh, web. And if you modify it, you instantly get all these notifications. You never have these different versions and stuff like this. So that might be useful. Uh, what advantages Kotlin has over Flutter? If one wishes solely to create Android or iOS apps, mm, Flutter, like they have diff a bit different goals. Flutter tries to you know, to uh, uh, to build uh, the whole native uh, the, the whole app native. So you write all the UI in Flutter, and that is uh, a di uh, big difference in what Kotlin tries to achieve here. Kotlin so Flutter is used for probably some simple apps and apps where you won't ever want to use native UI. And Kotlin is different because it, uh, from the start, says that probably UI should be native. So you still can create UI uh, for iOS in Kotlin, but it seems that either at one point you will want to do this or um, probably you want to do it from scratch. And Kotlin shares uh, and tries to share mainly the business logic between Android and iOS, but keep UI parts native to platforms. And that is important difference with Flutter approach, um, but otherwise uh, there are, uh, have some similarities. There are some ideas, oh, let's mix Flutter and Kotlin, but so far as I understand, it's not uh, a priority for both parts and it's not on the table. Yeah, but um, uh, Kotlin is great to sharing the business logic and uh, probably in terms of market share 
it's more suitable for bigger applications or the applications that might grow uh, in the future. And then uh, uh, you uh, you will use uh, Kotlin and uh, uh, and share lots of parts between Android areas. Is there any case where RxJava would be a better option than Coroutines? Um, I would say that now uh, we have, like, um, at first uh, we released Coroutines and there was uh, there were like often questions. Okay, we have RxJava for Android development, and uh, it's very um, spread there. And uh, what uh, how what, what should we use? And at that point there was no clear answer because RxJava had reactive streams and Coroutines didn't have reactive streams, but now it's different. Coroutines have their own implementation of reactive streams, which are flows. They are very much based on RxJava streams and uh, they are interoperable with them easily, so you can convert one to another. And uh, my answer today would be, you, if you start from scratch, just use coroutines and flow. You no, do not need uh, RxJava. If you if you have an app uh, that uh, use, uh, uses RxJava, you can consider, you can uh, wait options whether you want to uh, to write it to flow now and to, to gain the full benefit of coroutines or you don't want to write it but uh, you just want to support it uh, with RxJava and wait until flow has more operators and stuff like this. Mm, yeah, but uh, for now, with Flow, that they are very much um, uh, uh, competitive, and I would say that coroutines and Flow will come become the default at some point. But that's my personal opinion. Uh, I hope that uh, it will indeed happen. Does interoperable means Kotlin can be converted to any object oriented language, or it only works with Java code? By interoperable. I mean that uh, it uh, feels uh, like when you mix Kotlin and Java in one place, in one project, it just feels like there are no problems. It's just so uh, well thought out that you don't have to to suffer or to struggle how to call one from the other and so on. So it's not that Kotlin can be converted to any other language, no. Kotlin is compiled either to Java and bytecode or to JavaScript or to native binaries. And when I'm talking about good interoperability with Java, I mean specifically this Kotlin Java, this Kotlin Java bytecode target, compilation target, and I mean that it is so easy to mix them. It's no problem at all, and uh, it is very easy when you have a Java application and you start adding Kotlin there, there is no problems in it. You just can add Kotlin in different places and it just works. It's very, very useful. Um, then uh, what uh, if we are not defining an object? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I got this uh, question. If you want, you can uh, reward it. Uh, so when maybe you can. Sorry, go yes. ahead. So I'm saying the questions which, uh, uh, because these are the questions which were asked during your sessions breaks, right? Ah, okay, I see, I see. Yes, yeah, yeah. so, so probably. So I, I think that I will just uh, answer when I understand the question, and uh, that will be fine. Uh, so uh, about frameworks for available for uh, full stack development. So for now, one of the options is Kater and Kotlin React. You can check both. Uh, but uh, surely there are like many more options. Uh, you, you can check on our hands and labs uh, some sample projects uh, that um, um, usually. Uh, <laughs> there is question again about Flutter and what uh, Google tries to achieve. I can't say for Google and <laughs> I don't know what Google tries to achieve, but they they, they have sometimes uh, uh, such uh, cases. What happens? Uh, maybe Svetlana, Svetlana, one request. Yes. Maybe just you can just read the question uh, through for the ah, benefit sorry. of the audience. Yeah. At what extent Kotlin is currently used in industry, and is it beneficial to learn Kotlin as per career perspective? I think I would say definitely yes. Definitely, it is beneficial to learn Kotlin because Kotlin shows you many um, like aspects of uh, modern languages and. Uh, for instance, it, if you ever need to write in Swift, it will be very easy to convert uh, to switch from Kotlin to Swift, 
and to some other languages. And also, you can learn both object-oriented programming and functional programming in Kotlin. Okay, not for deep functional programming, but at least basics fact of functional programming. And uh, that also works uh, well in terms of even if you need to switch. And uh, I, I would say that it is um, currently used like for Android is uh, it's getting default. And uh, for server side, it one it is one of uh, the good options, and uh, it's often even like beneficial if you say you you know Kotlin and Java, it might be much easier to find a job, and you, it 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 gains uh, it gives some uh, benefits to to your resume. I would say, which is more easy to learn Java or Kotlin? Um, can't answer that unfortunately. I would say it's not about a language; it's about programming in general. Um, I also think that some, uh, like if you want to uh, learn Kotlin from scratch, try this atomic Kotlin and see how it uh, how it works. I would say that if you uh, use Kotlin for JVM, you still have to understand some basics of Java, but it's it's not required. But some basic you still need to to know to be a good Kotlin, even Kotlin Android developer. But I would definitely say that learning Kotlin is much more fun than learning Java. That's that's for sure because it has much more cool features <laughs> right now and uh, more modern representative. Um, and this I've already answered. How is Kotlin in terms of execution speed compared to Java? I would say similar. So uh, there we, we uh, there if we if we're talking about resulting byte codes, uh, they are very uh, very similar and there are no much difference. It mostly depends on how you write code and how you optimize it rather than uh, which language you use. Mm. Can we use a Java function in Kotlin? Yes, you can. Um, when we talk about uh, interoperability, you can use them both ways. You can use uh, Kotlin functions from Java and Java functions from Kotlin. It all works uh, very easily. Um, an online course to learn advanced uh, Kotlin. So far, we haven't. Uh, actually, I made a uh, not a mistake, but a strange thing. I promised uh, at the end of the Coursera course that we'll have more Coursera courses. But right now, we are going to at some point uh, do the material of advanced courses. But we're not sure about the Coursera platform as a platform for some reasons. So I can't uh, promise you that we'll have more courses at Coursera as I already told <laughs> somehow, but uh, at least uh, you can check our materials available on the site, these hands-ons, um, other stuff. You can also write us in different channels like in Slack and Twitter, whether you want to, to these specific topics to be covered, they might help us to prioritize things. Any, uh, any disadvantage of Kotlin over Java apart from speed? Uh, there is no speed disadvantage, so um, I don't know. Disadvantage the disadvantage might be if you work for someone who wants you to write Java and uh, you want to write Kotlin and uh, you're like, what should I do now? Quit or find another job? But other than that, but you see, I'm very Kotlin side, so you won't get an objective answer from me anyway. From me. Uh, Kotlin coroutines are similar to Go coroutines. Uh, give me a second, I will just read through the questions. Does the coroutines run in their own thread pool? Uh, uh, about thread pools, uh, coroutines, you, you, can run, you can specify uh, what thread pools should coroutines run. Uh, I didn't have enough So I have one talk at the fest, I think last year, that uh, this my talk was partly based on that talk, and um, there I cover uh, the thread uh, topic in more detail. And also I recommend Roman Glizarov talks in order to go, go go deeper and to see how exactly it's done. But basically, you can either provide a specific thread. Or you can provide run this coroutine on this thread on threads from this thread pool or something like this. 
uh, do jet brains. Uh, so there were questions about coroutines, but I uh, think that uh, we won't have mm, lo lots of time now, and I would just recommend you to um, to read about it uh, in our uh, documentations, uh, no tutorials. Do jet brains have dedicated ID for Kotlin? Uh, no, there is just uh, IntelliJ, and uh, if you if we just uh, talk about Kotlin, it's IntelliJ by default. But if uh, for Android, Android Studio is based on IntelliJ, so it uses just the same Kotlin plugin under the hood, uh, and uh, you can just you you just use the same the same code, the same um, ID support. Uh, how do you compare routines and futures in Java? Futures uh, uses callbacks, uh, so they have very um, like uh, they they have different ways to uh, to work with these callbacks in a convenient fashion, but they are still callbacks in the end. And coroutines is absolutely new approach. It's something totally different, and um, uh, that uh, is different. So it uh, coroutines can be compared are very similar to Go routines in Go. And uh, async await in coroutines works the same as async await in C sharp, but there is no analogous in Java. So coroutines is not uh, just some syntactic improvement, but is uh, something that is really new and is not present currently in Java. Is there any certification official? Uh, no, we have only uh, the certification for so called training partners, people who want to do trainings and uh, but we have no certification for individuals, and we don't um, in the future, at least in the nearest future, we don't plan to introduce one. If you want a certificate, you can finish the Coursera course, and the Coursera generates your certificate. However, make sure, like, keep in mind that uh, the assignments are, take a lot of time. I kind of overestimated uh, their underestimated their complexity. Sorry for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is the way to get their certificate. Uh, you can easily integrate Kotlin to existing uh, Java base. Mm. Uh, there is the question about how to converting uh, from Kotlin from Java to Kotlin. There is a way to convert Java code to Kotlin. And uh, it generates some unnecessary code which can be reduced. That's true. You have to uh, like because Java doesn't have all these uh, possibilities that Kotlin provides. Uh, you can often improve the resulting code. And uh, the question is: Is there any measure to what is good and should we use how to convert? Yes, how to convert is very useful. So why not? Uh, it's helpful. But you have to edit the code after the conversion and uh, better do separate commits, like one commit that just converts and another commit that uh, uh, cleans the code. We have uh, on the Kotlin website uh, some um, recommendations uh, called Kotlin code, st uh, code style, uh, but uh, in many cases it's still, like uh, this uh, style guide covers lots of cases, but there are many more cases uh, that um, and uh, you, you use your own reasoning and some information that we mention in different uh, documentation tutorials, Coursera course. So uh, there is no one document or um, something that um, you should use uh, to check whether you did everything correctly. Um, uh, 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 there is a question, is the garbage collection lower in Kotlin that is used to be in Java? It's just the same. So garbage collection, because uh, Kotlin generates the same bytecode as Java does, uh, then a garbage collector works and it's just, it depends on JVM. So it's some JVM specific code, uh, language specific. Uh, is there any plan to make Kotlin more useful for data, data science? Yes, and uh, there was a blog post uh, in the Kotlin blog recently that um, highlights uh, one of the things that uh, is uh, um, th that's worked on. 
so we have uh, people who work uh, on Kotlin specifically for data science. And uh, also you can uh, check uh, the code, uh, the talk by Roman Pilov from the last Kotlicons. Uh, he covers uh, what uh, what are what we do there. So we, we we really believe that Kotlin might be very useful for data science, uh, but uh, uh, we, we'll, like we'll, we'll see what uh, can be uh, done to increase the adoption there. Um, where should we study Kotlin if we have sufficient knowledge in other programming languages but don't know Java? That I uh, I'm not sure I can give you an answer. You can check uh, all the resources that target Java developers. I would say that depends on the lang of the language that you have in mind. If it's like if it's Python, that probably you first need to understand all this uh, idea of uh, static typing because it's different. If it's uh, for instance C sharp or C plus plus, I think uh, you will find like you you already know all this object oriented programming. Uh, stuff and you can uh, use uh, Kotlin for Java resources. Uh, we have some guides uh, and some internet materials uh, targeted for developers of specific backgrounds, uh, but um, not not that much, I would say. So uh, you can check it by your own. Um, does Kotlin allow to use primitive types such as info double? Yes, absolutely uh, the same. Um, okay, not. Uh, under the hood, they are the same primitives, but in Kotlin, you you just use uh, integer types. Uh, and uh, uh, so there are questions, can you learn Kotlin without knowing Java? Yes, and I provided Atomic Kotlin as uh, one of the resources. Uh, mm, there, there is a question about uh, different slides and late in it, but I would recommend to, to, to check it in the Coursera course. For instance, I cover that uh, in detail there, and you can just look at this, um, the, uh, just this topic. And uh, what is the percentage of companies using Kotlin? Unfortunately, I can't say in terms of the worldwide because it's just too, too, too many companies uh, over there. Uh, so I hope I've answered uh, more some of these questions. Sorry, I didn't have enough time to uh, to go deeper into coroutines, but I will really I would really recommend to if you're interested check hands on and other talks. It would be I think more effective than um, me answering this question right now because it's also visual thing and you can slowly uh, follow and uh, see and understand how it all works and uh, find uh, other interesting details there. So I think uh, we're done, um, Pratik, and um, uh, I think we can um, finalize our webinar. Yes, yeah. uh, Svetlana, thank you very much uh, for your time. I let Ramya conclude the webinar. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Svetlana, for your time. That was um, very much insightful session. Um, all these in these, thank you so much for staying up late uh, for the webinar. Um, if you have any questions that need to be directed to the JetBrain team um, uh, with respect to coaching, uh, do let me know. You can uh, write back to me to my email. Um, I will pass on your queries to um, uh, the team, and probably we can consolidate answers and then sort of take it further. Uh, in addition to which, um, uh, we probably will also have the uh, recorded session of the webinar, which will be sent to you over the email. Uh, there will also be a feedback form that will be rolled out to you uh, tomorrow. Uh, do make sure uh, to fill in the feedback for us uh, so that you know, in, in, in case how helpful the was the session and if you would want to attend more sessions like this. Uh, that is uh, pretty much it. Thank you so much for your time and thanks. Uh, thank you for attending. Thank you, thank you Svetlana, and to speak for taking your time here with us. Uh, yeah, good night, team, and stay safe. Uh, bye. Thank, thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Bye -bye.